Thanks to you at home for joining us tonight. Happy to have you with us. Uh, this is the largest U.S. air base in the Middle East. Um, it is a logistics hub for ongoing U.S. operations in Afghanistan and in Iraq. It is a key asset for the U.S. military in terms of its air power, among other places, um, in, in the Syrian civil war and in every engagement and training mission in the region. This is a huge base. There's like 10 or 11,000 American personnel. Um, and it is all the more striking the size and the import of this base, given what a small place it is in. Because this huge U.S. airbase is located in the tiny nation of Qatar, this really big American outpost in that very small country, which sticks out like a thumb into the Persian Gulf, uh, right off the coast of, of Saudi Arabia, right next to the United Arab Emirates. And of course, America has complicated and textured relationships with every major country in the, in the Middle East. But with Qatar, uh, we do have this one very special thing, right? In, in that we've got this huge air base there. There are a ton of active duty service members, American service members, who live there all the time, right? That special thing about us and Qatar was what made it a weirder than usual moment in the Trump presidency. Uh, when just a few months after he was sworn in, President Trump summoned the courage to try to pronounce Qatar live and in front of some cameras, I think for the very first time ever. Uh, the reason that he decided he would take the leap and try to pronounce Qatar was so he could proclaim them to be a bunch of terrorists. The nation of Qatar, unfortunately, has historically been a funder of terrorism at a very high level. Now, this was a somewhat random occasion for the president to bring this up. Uh, he was standing there in the Rose Garden. You may not, might not recognize the flag behind President Trump there. Um, th he was standing there in the Rose Garden with the president of Romania when that thing about Qatar, or as he calls it, Qatar, uh, popped out of his mouth like a loose denture. It was also strange, though, because it, that comment about Qatar appeared to be completely disassociated from anything else going on in U.S. policy at the time. I mean, to put a very fine point on how weird it was that the president decided that day that he was going to denounce Qatar as a bunch of terrorists, I mean, literally less than a week later, the U.S. government sold Qatar a whole bunch of F-15 fighter jets, $12.5 billion worth of fighter jets. So where did that thing come from, from Trump that day, with him, apropos of nothing, denouncing Qatar, denouncing this country that has the largest U.S. airbase in the Middle East, this key U.S. ally in the Middle East? Why did he say that? Well, who knows exactly and for sure. But if you start flipping through the rap sheets, literally the criminal history of some of the people associated with this president and his campaign, you may get pretty close to a story that explains it. Elliot Broidy uh, was a top fundraiser for Donald Trump during the campaign. He was then named deputy finance chair of the National Republican Party uh, after Trump became the party's nominee for president. Elliot Broidy also narrowly avoided prison time when he became a cooperating witness back in the day after he was caught paying an elaborate and brazen series of bribes to financial regulators in New York State, along with their family members and their mistresses. That sort of a record was apparently not a barrier of entry, a uh, barrier for entry into the upper echelons of the Trump campaign in 2016 and into the upper echelons of the Republican Party in the Trump era. Uh, at the Trump inaugural festivities, Elliot Brody, of course, was there. And at the inauguration, he reportedly hooked up with another Trump-connected ex-con who the New York Times reports would go on to take frequent meetings. Uh, 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 sorry, the New York Times reports had taken frequent meetings throughout the campaign with, with Donald Trump Jr. and Jared Kushner and Mike Flynn after the inauguration, the, the inauguration during the first year of the Trump administration. Um, this guy was also reported to have spent lots of time at the Trump White House, including multiple visits to Steve Bannon's office just off the Oval. Uh, his name was George Nader. And his criminal history included multiple convictions for child pornography and child molestation in two countries, resulting in at least two prison sentences. So when Elliot Broidy, the guy who had narrowly avoided prison in the New York State bribery scheme, and George Nader, the multiply convicted child pornography and child, child molestation guy, when they met up at the Trump inaugural, that was clearly a match made somewhere other than heaven. But they hit it off 
And those two men, after meeting at the Trump inaugural, reportedly decided that they would go into a kind of business together. Because George Nader had long-standing connections to two Gulf monarchies, to the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, those two countries quite near Qatar that we just showed on the map. Uh, Nader, at various points, appears to have been a, a paid emissary or some kind of diplomatic go-between for the royal families of both UAE and Saudi Arabia. According to landmark reporting from the Associated Press, the basic deal that Elliot Broidy and George Nader hatched after they met at the inauguration was that Nader would use those connections he had with the royal families in Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, he'd use those connections to get huge contracts from those countries for Elliot Broidy. Broidy was operating some kind of defense contracting firm. Nader was planning to hook him up with a huge amount of contracting revenue, like a billion dollars in contracts from UAE and Saudi Arabia. Was that because his defense contracting firm was the greatest one on earth and ought to have those contracts? I don't know, but this is what Broidy was reportedly going to do in exchange for him getting those contracts. In exchange for those billion dollars worth of contracts, Broidy, Right? This deputy finance chair for the RNC, leading fundraiser for the Trump campaign. Broidy would use his influence with the new Trump administration to get the administration to do things that the U.S. government would never otherwise be inclined to do, but that Saudi and United Arab Emirates wanted. Specifically, in exchange for his company getting a billion dollars in contracts, Broidy would reportedly try to persuade the Trump administration that the president should start talking smack against Qatar, that the U.S. government should turn against Qatar, that the U.S. government should separate itself from and start denouncing Qatar, where we have that huge airbase, right? Qatar, this crucial U.S. ally in the Middle East, the biggest U.S. military outpost anywhere in the Middle East. Those other Gulf countries right next to Qatar, though, UAE and Saudi Arabia, they see Qatar as their arch enemy. They want to turn the U.S. government against Qatar. How much would they be willing to pay for that? Almost anything, presumably. Well, George Nader and Elliot Broidy reportedly teamed up after they met at the Trump inauguration to try to give those countries someone to pay in order to achieve that result. And that result, the president himself inexplicably delivered in the Rose Garden, standing right next to the president of Romania on a fine June day in 2017, just months after he was inaugurated. Out of the blue, inexplicably denouncing Qatar as terrorists. It's almost like you could pick any day on the calendar. You could pick any day the Trump administration has been in effect. Just pick one thing that happened that day. If you then go back and tell the full backstory as to what led to that moment in the Trump administration and what cast of characters made that moment possible, I mean, if you cast it really well and you got like George Clooney or, or, or Ben Stiller to direct it, right? I mean, like, you could make a movie about any day of the Trump administration that had a plot that was more scandalous than anything that has happened in any other U.S. presidential administration since there were cars <laughs> or like since there was America. I mean, just the president making those, or anyway. But now these kinds of trailing ends and the fuller backstory on these ex-cons and these revealed schemes, they're all starting to come to some dramatic conclusions. When it comes to that seedy little plot to apparently pay for the U.S. government turning against our ally Qatar, well, Elliot Broidy, he is no longer the deputy finance chairman of the RNC. He stepped down from that position when it was revealed that he made hush money payments to a Playboy model with whom he had had an affair. Oddly, his hush money payment to that woman was brokered by the president's longtime attorney, Michael Cohen, and another attorney named Keith Davidson, the two guys who were involved in the president's very similar hush money payments before the election, arrangements for which Michael Cohen is now serving his own federal prison sentence and for which he, too, had to step down as deputy finance chairman of the RNC. Brighty himself has also reportedly come under federal investigation for, among other things, offering to have the Justice Department investigation into a huge international fraud case turned off. Brighty was offering a contract in which he said that he could get that investigation quashed if the interested parties would pay him and his wife $75 million. Now, why did Elliot Brighty believe that he could turn off a major Justice Department investigation? in exchange for tens of millions of dollars? I don't know. But that is one of a number of issues for which Elliot Broidy has reportedly come under investigation. Nice folks from the Trump campaign. Nice folks from the Trump era 
Republican National Committee. Now, as for Elliot Broidy's business partner in that Cutter thing, well, as of today, he has a new and newly serious additional child pornography charge to contend with. Uh, Devlin Barrett and Rachel Weiner at The Washington Post were first to break the news today that George Nader has been indicted again on new child pornography charges stemming from an FBI search of his three iPhones at Dulles Airport in January of last year. These charges we now know have been pending against Nader for months, but apparently he's been out of the country and therefore out of the reach of U.S. federal law enforcement despite this sealed criminal complaint against him and a sealed warrant for his arrest that were filed with the court last April. Uh, he fell back into the clutches of U.S. law enforcement today when he re-entered the country. He flew into JFK Airport in the New York City area, reportedly to seek medical treatment. Upon landing at the airport, he was arrested and taken into custody. Today, he made an initial appearance in the Eastern District of New York, which means in federal court in Brooklyn. The magistrate judge hearing his case said she believed that Nader is a flight risk. She would not give him bail today. She ordered him held overnight and reassessed tomorrow. He is expected ultimately to be conveyed to Virginia, to the Eastern District of Virginia, where he will face these new child pornography charges. But as I said, these types of charges are not a novel thing for George Nader. In 1985, he was charged with importing child pornography into the United States. He ultimately had that charge dismissed on a technicality. A few years later, in 1991, he was again charged with importing child pornography from overseas. In that case, he was convicted. He was given a six-month sentence. Years later, in 2003, he was sentenced again, this time in the Czech Republic. This time not for child pornography, but for child molestation. That conviction also resulted in a prison sentence in the Czech Republic. Despite that extensive record, though, George Nader did become some kind of advisor to the government of the United Arab Emirates and the government of Saudi Arabia. And he did then attach himself like a barnacle to the Trump campaign and the Trump White House, where he really made himself one of the guys. Uh, he was apparently around a lot. In August 2016, during the presidential campaign, George Nader organized a meeting at Trump Tower, which ultimately became the subject of this blockbuster report in the New York Times this time last year. At the Trump Tower meeting were George Nader, Donald Trump Jr., Eric Prince, and a man named Joel Zamel, who was reportedly offering at that meeting an off-the-shelf foreign election interference effort that would be run by Mr. Zamel's Israeli company and would be financed by some of these Gulf monarchies that Mr. Nader worked for, all to benefit the Trump campaign by flooding American social media and what amounted to a giant psyops campaign to turn off Clinton voters and boost Trump. That's what he was offering. The Trump campaign, of course, says they weren't buying. But the Times reports that after that meeting, George Nader became a frequent presence around the Trump campaign. He took multiple meetings with Jared Kushner and with Michael Flynn and with Steve Bannon. After Trump got elected in November of that year, George Nader reportedly made a $2 million payment to one of Joel Zamel's companies. Again, Zamel was the guy who had been offering a foreign election interference effort for sale at that Trump Tower meeting back in August. And again, the Trump campaign says they didn't buy what he was offering. But still, Nader paid him $2 million right after the election, and that payment has still never been explained. That same month, December 2016, George Nader is the one who organized another meeting, this one involving Jared Kushner, Mike Flynn, Steve Bannon, and the Crown Prince of United Arab Emirates, who's usually described in the West by his initials, MBZ. That meeting took place in New York at the Four Seasons Hotel. Again, this was right after the election, December 2016. And that meeting ended up becoming a sort of flashing red light for the Obama administration at the time, because it was a big breach of protocol. It was a strange thing for this, the Crown Prince of this U.S. ally, the senior government official, in fact, the de facto ruler of that country, to come visit the United States without telling the current administration that he was going to be paying a visit. That's a very unusual thing. It's not the way these things are usually done. But in fact, that meeting that George Nader organized in December 2016, it involved the Crown Prince of the United Arab Emirates there in person, plus all of those Trump transition officials. It was conducted as a secret thing. The United Arab Emirates did not notify the Obama administration that he was coming in. They found out anyway that MBZ was here and that he took that meeting. But knowing that he had secretly come into the country to take that secret meeting set off alarm bells for the Obama administration. 
A month after that, in January 20, 2017, just before the inauguration itself, George Nader set up another meeting. And this time it was in an exotic locale. It was on the Seychelles Islands. George Nader is the one who organized that strange encounter where Eric Prince, the brother of Betsy DeVos, who's the education secretary, the founder of the controversial security firm Blackwater, a man who is described in the Mueller report as essentially being um, a, a, an informal representative of the Trump transition. He met with the head of a Russian sovereign wealth fund in Seychelles Islands in a meeting that was set up by George Nader. That meeting is now believed to have been yet another effort by the Russian government between the Russian government and the Trump campaign to try to set up some sort of back channel secret communications between the two. Nader set up that meeting in the Seychelles as well. The crown prince of the UAE was there. MBZ was there. Eric Prince was there. The guy from the Russian sovereign wealth fund was there as an emissary of the Kremlin. Nader is the one who brought them all together. That's January 2017. Later that month, Donald Trump is sworn in and become presidents, becomes president. Axios goes on to report that George Nader becomes a frequent visitor in the Trump White House. During that first year that Trump is in office, that's when Nader and Elliot Broidy are apparently trying to pull off this scheme where Broidy will get paid a billion dollars worth of contracts in exchange for him using his influence to turn the president, to turn the U.S. government against Qatar, despite the fact that we have this big air base there. And then as we are rolling up on the one year anniversary of Trump being in office in January of 2018, George Nader apparently makes plans to travel to Mar-a-Lago to attend what were expected to be over the top festivities at the president's private club in Florida to celebrate his first year in office. On his way to Mar-a-Lago, George Nader has to transit through Dulles Airport just outside Washington. Now, whenever he does that, he probably has prison sentence flashbacks. Because back in 1991, one of the times he was prosecuted on child porn charges, the way he got caught in 1991 is that customs officials found child pornography on reels, on reel-to-reel -reel tapes that were concealed in candy containers in his luggage while he was flying in from Germany and trying to pick up his luggage in Dulles. They went through his luggage, they found the child porn that led to those 1991 charges and the prison sentence thereafter. This time, January 2018, again, he's going through Dulles. And this time, the child porn was not on reel-to-reel -reel tapes that he had to secret somewhere inside his luggage. This time, his newer stash of child porn was allegedly stored on his multiple iPhones. And unluckily for George Nader, when he was transiting through Dulles Airport that day, on his way to Mar-a-Lago in January 2018, the FBI agents who stopped him at the airport had a search warrant to look into his luggage, to search his person, and to search his electronic devices. Now, it appears that those search warrants related to the Mueller investigation, to Mueller looking into foreign interference in the 2016 election. Today's FBI affidavit filed in the new criminal case against Nader describes those search warrants as being unrelated to child pornography. So child porn is not what they were looking for when they stopped and searched George Nader at Dulles Airport last January when he was on his way to Mar-a-Lago. But child pornography is nevertheless what the government says they found. And so to the already absolutely sordid and somewhat terrifying tale of George Nader, you can now add this new twist. I mean, we know from the context provided by the Mueller report that basically immediately after the FBI agents stopped Nader at Dulles Airport in January of 2018, Immediately after that contact where they stopped him on his way to Mar-a-Lago, George Nader almost immediately became a cooperating witness for Mueller. Nader is all over the Mueller report, particularly when it comes to the section of that report that describes efforts between the Russian government and the Trump campaign to use various intermediaries to create secret back-channel communications between the two entities. Even this weekend in The Times, there was new reporting about how prosecutors are still investigating whether MBZ and the United Arab Emirates might have been involved in some kind of illegal influence operation concerning the 2016 election and the Trump campaign. But, but what does this mean that, that George Nader has now been arrested? I mean, it had been widely reported in multiple reputable news sources that when Nader started cooperating with Mueller's investigation, he was doing so under a grant of limited immunity. He was getting immunity in exchange for his testimony. 
And Mueller's report says in black and white that all but one of the interviews that Nader did with the special counsel's office were under the umbrella of some sort of proffer agreement, meaning that Nader would have had some sort of immunity in exchange for the testimony that he was giving to Mueller. But if that all is true, if Nader had worked out some sort of deal with prosecutors to avoid being charged for his own crimes, why did they draw up a sealed criminal complaint and arrest warrant for him in April of last year? I mean, that's the complaint and arrest warrant that were acted on today when he re-entered the country. If he had some sort of immunity deal with prosecutors, what was the immunity for? I mean, what was he not charged for if he was charged for this? I mean, these, these child pornography allegations that he's facing, the prison term for this is a, a range of 15 to 40 years. He didn't get immunity for this, but he did get immunity for something else? Or was he awarded immunity for these alleged crimes too, but for some reason that immunity deal that he had has now been called off, either because of something that he did or because of some change in the way the Justice Department is looking at it. George Nader has been one of the most unnerving characters and ex-cons in a Trump campaign that frankly is full of them. He was also a crucial witness for the Mueller report, including on a number of aspects of that investigation that as far as we can tell, have not yet been wrapped up. News of his arrest today is horrifying in many ways. It is also kind of a shock. The reporter who broke the news first joins us next. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.